All right. Groovy. And at any time to got my awesome training team here with me, Jason and Sarah, who can help mitigate any tech glitches in the chat box. Also, too, at any point today, if you have a question, a comment, an insight, a curiosity, a story, jump right in. Jump right in. Chat box, come off of mute, whatever you would like, because today, like I've been saying, it is just going to be a conversation where we're going to be sharing some some of our insights, some of our lessons learned, but then also creating space and opportunity where we can learn from you all as well. And it looks like we got somebody else that just joined. So I'll put the link to the Google workbook in the chat box as well for our new members. And let's get this show started. Let's get this show started. So I am Dave Clausen, CEO and founder of DJC Solutions. Uh, fun fact, family of service, my grandfather, my dad all served as well. I enlisted when I was 17, going on 18 as a junior in high school. Now, I went Illinois Army National Guard because I saw it as the best of both worlds, y'all, plus free college. Now, I did pick Army Infantry because I like hunting. I like the outdoors. My dad, was re- he's a retired sergeant major. He's an Army Ranger as well. And he was, and he still is, my hero. I wanted to walk in his footsteps. And fast forward, I got deployed to Iraq the first semester of my junior year. Spent some time in Bulgaria as well, trained with Bulgarian Army, which was a whole nother different type of experience. Uh, But I came back, I struggled with an undiagnosed traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, and alcohol for years. But then as I, as I pursued and sought after recovery, sobriety, I really started to learn about prevention science. And at that same time as I'm learning about prevention and through the lens of my own struggles, I was working as a police officer at Eastern Illinois University, where I actually got to talk to and work alongside prevention professionals. I've been team prevention ever since, having worked at the Illinois Higher Ed Center SAMHSA's Center for the Application of Prevention Technology. Yes, they love long names because also most recently I was the director of the Mid-America Prevention Technology Transfer Center. I have to practice saying all these doggone things. Uh, But long story short, or to make a long story long, coupling my personal experience, my time as a police officer on a college campus, I see the value and importance of prevention, especially when it comes to service members, veterans, and their families as well. So I'm so pumped to be able to bring this series to you all and have these conversations we're going to have. With me, though, got a stellar training team, and I'm excited to, to have the opportunity to introduce you to them all. And uh, Sarah, tell us who you are. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's having a wonderful Wednesday down in hopefully sunny Louisiana today. That's a little gray and chilly up here in Virginia, outside of the largest naval base, my hometown, Norfolk, Virginia, Virginia Beach area. Um, This is where I grew up and proud to call home. Um, Like Dave, come from a military family myself. My father was career Navy, retired to 20 years. Uh, We were in the old military service where he only did one deployment, but fortunately for us, I did have an opportunity uh, to live overseas and travel throughout Europe and learn about culture and uh, visit lots of different places. Um, Also, because I am a first-generation American, it was a little different being a military family and my mother not being a native from America. So there was a lot of different uh, culture shocks and things that she experienced as we were traveling with the military, um, but gave me a very good, well-rounded appreciation for culture and worldly perspectives. Um, Also, have two brothers who served in the military. My older brother, joined active duty army and then my younger brother enlisted in the virginia national guard Um, both of them were deployed to iraq um, and had 
very unique experiences. I was an adult when they were deployed and um, had different experiences supporting them, supporting <clears throat> their families, their children throughout that time period. Um, very proud of my service, my family, excuse me, my, my family service and uh, very honored to share this space with you all this morning. Very, very passionate about prevention as I've, you know, shared um, with Dave in a podcast about, you know, the first time that I sat in a QPR training when I was first introduced to prevention and really understanding the warning signs of suicide and really having this understanding that if my family would have had this information at the time that my brother was in crisis, we might have reacted differently to his uh, crisis moment. And so now I use my experiences as a lost survivor, passionate about prevention, to getting the message out there that prevention works. We can increase those protective fam factors, uh, support families, support individuals in crisis, and be successful and productive members uh, of this world. And I'm honored to share this space with my co-trainers here, Dave and Jason, and also honored that you all took time out of your day today to hear from us and uh, share with us the things that you would like to see, the passions that you have, and how we may facilitate you know, and encourage and, and fan the flame and set you off to, to do amazing work for the people that you serve in Louisiana. So thank you all. Jason. Well, good morning, everybody, Louisiana. I'm uh, Jason Anderson. It's an honor and a privilege to get to spend some time with you folks as well. Um, a few things about me. I, I hail from northern Minnesota, actually. Um, and yet today I'm coming to you from Albuquerque, a uh, long story that I'll spare you, just a training thing and some flights and whatever. But I'm in a hotel room in Albuquerque and couldn't be happier to be here with you. Uh, I came to the military, uh, it's a similar story to Dave. Really, I enlisted between my junior and senior year of high school. I was 17, going on 18 and enlisted in the delayed entry program uh, and enlisted right before the Gulf War broke out in 91. So uh, served during that era. Uh, spent a career in corrections, doing probation and parole work. Uh, it, it really enjoyed that field, spent a lot of years in it and, and uh, loved a lot of it, but was introduced to prevention about 10 years ago, uh, doing some substance abuse prevention in my community. Um, I've done a lot of training around motivational interviewing in the span of my career. And now I'm a full-time consultant trainer. I do a lot of MI training, motivational interviewing training. Um, and some other prevention work affiliated with the Montana Institute and with Dave and doing this this great work. I'm also a member of a local uh, crisis response team, a veterans crisis response team. And I'm going to speak about that a little bit later in our time together this morning. In my military experience, I, I had a couple of um, deployments, one to Kuwait just the summer following the ground war. It was still a, a uh, what did they call it, a hazard fire pay area, a combat zone, but I didn't see combat. Uh, similarly, I was deployed to Macedonia to watch the uh, the Serbian border in uh, Christmas of 93 into 94, um, served alongside the Norwegians and the Swedes and the Finnish army. That was interesting. Uh, after my time in the active army, I transitioned directly into the Minnesota National Guard, Army National Guard, and served with them through my time in college. So I had about four years with them. Um, and as a, as other things you see on my my list, I, I do some lay ministry some uh, as a lay pastor covering for different parishes and, and churches that are without um, full-time pastors. And I love the outdoors. I love everything outdoors. I hunt and fish and trap and, and canoe and do all of those goofy things. And I love the sound of my own voice. I love telling stories. And so I'm, I'm privileged and honored to get to hang with you guys this morning and share with you some of my experiences and maybe, maybe a story or two along the way. So um, we're excited to be here with you guys, and uh, with that, we're going to hit the ground running, so let's go. Yeah, so today, throughout our session, we have 
woven in the top 10 things not to say to a veteran because language plays such an important role, how we interact, how we engage with veterans, with the service members, veterans, and their family members can be oh so powerful in a positive way, but in a not so good way. And I also thought it might be a fun little way to just break up the flow of this training. Yes, indeed. So this is our first one. It's our very, very first one. Sarah, what is this one? Yo, Dave, you don't look like a veteran. Right? Oh my gosh, Dave, you don't look like a veteran at all. And one of the reasons you don't say this, veterans, we come from all walks of life, all different appearances. And in fact, when I got back from my deployment, I tried to dis distance myself from my veteran identity or piece of my identity because of stigma, because of how I thought I was going to be perceived. And so I tried as hard as I could to not look like a quote, stereotypical veteran there as well. That was a big part of my, uh, my journey, my journey, but yes, <laughs> number 10, hold on for number nine. Uh, but yeah, what are we doing today, Jason? Yeah. So the order of business, this is what we put together. But as Dave said, when we, when he kicked this thing up, we want this to be your training. We want this to be helpful. We want this to be interactive. Um, so we welcome your input, your observations, your questions, of course. Um, but this is this is the order of things that we've assembled for you. We're going to talk about who does serve, who are our veterans, um, and lift that up and, and 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 call that out. How are they perceived? How does how does your community, how does our society view them? How do we shift the narrative? How do we shift the narrative? Maybe to how we view them. How do we shift the narrative to how we approach them and respond to them and support them? Crafting a Crafting, crafting, I'm not Englishing very well today. Crafting a practical vision. Like, how do we put this, um, you know, we can go from concepts and ideas, to, but okay, no, when the rubber meets the road, what does it really look like? Those are the things we have in mind. But you see that last bullet? This is what we, this, so this is me evoking from you. What are you hoping to get from today? You saw the title of the presentation. You saw the flyers and the, the, the pushes outs and the emails and whatnot. And you, you signed up for it because you were hoping for something in particular. Um, what is that? And, and so if it, if it's, especially if it's something that, that doesn't seem to be addressed in those top four bullets, what is it you would like to get out of our time to get today and or in the subsequent sessions? So please drop that into the chat or just boldly unmute yourself and shout it out. We want to make sure that we're meeting your needs here today. So what is it you're hoping to cover, take away, or learn from today? I mean, I'm looking forward to hearing some of your stories, Jason. Well, me too. I love the sound of my voice. I right? love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love so in, having in, this in, conversation. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. In, in, in our, my, my call out to that isn't intended to be just an acute thing like, hey, this is your only chance to, to add it. So if, you're, if nothing's coming front to mind right now, that's fine. But as we move along, if, there, if a question comes up like, well, I wonder if they're ever going to get into dot, dot, dot. Or I wonder, I'd like to learn more about this. Please shout it out, drop it into the chat, whatever works for you. We, again, we really want this to be your training. Hey, good morning. I'm Dustin. Yeah, Dustin, what do you got? Hey, um, I was looking through it. I'm a, I'm a combat veteran myself, and uh, the, I guess the legally challenged veterans. I'm completing veterans court in uh, I don't know, twelve days or so, and uh, that seems to be an issue. Uh, it goes along with the substance misuse. Yeah. Yeah. So those justice involved veterans, how do we help support them? How do we, how do we attend to their stuff? Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's great to hear that you have a veterans court in your community. It's, uh, it's, it's such an effective approach and, um, yeah, the more we can support those and, and encourage communities to lean into that. All right. Thanks, Matt. We'll we got a good one in the chat box as well. Yeah. How do we best navigate military culture? 
when dealing with someone in active addiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Active addiction. Yeah. I am taking notes. Yeah, this is great. Thank you both. Thank you for adding this. And uh, other, other, other thoughts, other um, wonderings, other topics that you're hoping that we're going to dip our toe into or dive straight into. And again, if it doesn't come front to mind now, we welcome it at any time. But thank you to those who have, yeah. who have offered them. Leslie, what you got? So you're yeah, off so mute. I was gonna, oh. I'm off mute. Yes. Um, yeah. So I was going to ask as our, you know, our agency is Office of Behavioral Health. Um, and so we, well, I'm at state office. We have regional offices across the state. And I think that for us, we, we want to be able to provide services to everyone. But specifically, we, we never want, you know, the SMVF population to go without. Um, but I don't know that we always know how to reach out or, um, are there particular trainings that you would recommend? Um, because, I, you know, we want to make sure that we are, that we are respectful, right? Mm -hmm. And acknowledge, um, you know, some of the things that perhaps our veterans have experienced while at the same time wanting to be helpful. Um, but, you know, because we're a state agency, so we serve everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And there's not one of us that would say that we didn't want to serve um, you know, service member veterans and their families. So I think we, as a state agency, maybe we don't always know the best way to approach or how do we promote mm -hmm. or, um, and I'm just curious. And then we have like the 988 grant where I know you guys have some things that uh, really support suicide prevention among veterans. And like from a 988 perspective, it's like if you call 988, you can press one. So I guess, have you guys heard anything about the usefulness of that. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm just here to like be a sponge and soak it all up. But I think as a state agency, we're well-intentioned um, to want to do, you know, to want to do right, um, I guess, by our service of our frames. But maybe sometimes we don't know how to provide that outreach um, or, you know, to make sure that we're culturally appropriate and responsive and those kinds of things. So just... Um, Hopefully, we'll learn a little bit about how we can how we can do that for those of us that have not mm -hmm. been part of that military culture. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. It's great, great questions. All right. Well, that's something from Jamie here in the chat. Worked at a state office as well. Want to know how to bridge the gaps in services between those that are available through VA and, and what our program programs offer. That's a brilliant question, Jamie. There, oh, there's so many so many dynamics within that, right? Um, and services that the VA offer, and and some of those services are dependent on, like the VA's definition of who a vet is, even right? Who's eligible for certain services and whatnot? Um, so yeah, this, this is this is great. How do we bridge those gaps in services? We hate it when it exists, but it, it does exist. So how do we, as those trying to provide the care and being from, you know, the, especially those state offices over from above, how, what can I do to, to be nimble in the funding decisions I make? What can I do to be nuanced and, and uh, not, not, you know, paint with broad brushes about how we decide to, to provide services or funding for different things? At the same time, not letting things get too watered down also. So great question. Great, great question. All right. Well, thank you for those. And again, if we have more, don't hesitate to drop them into the chat. Unmute yourself boldly and throw it out to us. We want this to be the best thing for you possible. So with that, we're going we're gonna to roll. We're going to go. Um, and without apology, uh, Dave and I use this training as an opportunity to drop in as many photos as we probably could from our from our personal services so you're going to see a bit of a slideshow here of some photos this was this was me in macedonia i'm that uh, oh i thought it was so cool with those sunglasses man i thought i was cool in those sunglasses um sitting outside the airport in skopia macedonia waiting for the c-130s to roll in and to get us out of there after our time and oh i had the beret man i thought it was cool cool stuff if you could pick a word if you could pick one word to represent the service member, veteran, and family 
community. What would a word be? What would a word be? So we're, we've got an interactive thing for this. We've got a QR code, or you can go to the UCAP. You can do this a couple of different ways to drop in your word. What's the one word you would use to describe this community? Service members, veterans, and the family members. How would you describe them? And while you're puzzling over that, I see another thing in the chat. How would we build rapport with those who have served? Being someone who has never served. How would I have them trust me? Oh, yes. I love this. And Alicia, I know that we do have some, we have some content around that, but that's a brilliant question. So, okay, let's look at some of these words coming in from word, wool clap. Man, it is so cool doing training with Dave because Dave's got a master's degree in technology. So he's breaking out all of these tech things. I'm happy when I turn on my laptop and the screen illuminates. Like that's a, that's a win for me. Let's see what else. Is also the dropped oh. a link in the chat if you need it. I know the QR code is not up there anymore, but you can easily access the Woo Clap. Oh, there we go. See some, some others familiarizing yourself with this fun tool that Dave set up for us that heroic and proud what other words and you can enter more than one word also you can as many one words as you'd like loyal heroes important like it well driven I like that it's cool. humble my humility is one of my better features that my my rugged good looks but those the two are, it's a tie. It's a tie. Resilience coming in big. Mm -hmm. Selfless sacrifice. Motion. Integrity. Hmm. Principle. Oh, that's sometimes forgot. I just felt that one in my chest. Yeah, that one landed. Like, oh, cool. mm -hmm. yeah. Got to catch my breath after that one. Misunderstood. Dependable. I got to tell you, feel free to keep adding these. We're going to pull this out. And then at the end of this series, all the great information y'all have contributed and shared and actors like this will compile them and have a kind of a summary document that really encapsulates all the, the information, the wisdom that we've shared and you all have shared as well. Uh, so we can then email that out to you all as a, a follow-up resource. Vulnerable. Just talking about that on Monday. Vulnerability. Your strength and vulnerability. Yeah. That's it. Well, I got to tell you, I'm kind of glad that, that I didn't see words like troubled, broken, damaged, crazy. Because quite frankly, those are all things that I'd been referred to as when I came back from Iraq and just that language, how we interact and how we engage the veterans, those words are oh so powerful. Like that, that one just hit me right in the chest. Like, oh yeah, sometimes forgotten. Like I feel that like words are oh so powerful. Oh, so powerful. But as we continue this journey and this conversation, we're going to just talk a little bit about, you know, how can we get to know who serves? So then we can better tailor our prevention efforts to support, to empower, and serve the service member, veteran, and family community, aka SMVF for short, which you'll probably hear us say because saying service members, veterans, and their families can be a bit of a mouthful as well. So SMVF. But foundations of service, I kind of hinted at why I enlisted. You know, I told y'all that my dad was my hero. He was re he's a retired Sergeant Major, Army Ranger in Vietnam. And for those of you that may have seen the movie Hamburger Hill with uh, about Vietnam, uh, before that battle, before it was Hamburger Hill, my dad led his Ranger team doing the recon work on that hill. And while set up in a 360 that night, he got struck by lightning. Yeah. I mean, just like literally struck by lightning, medevaced, whole other story there. But he's my hero. I grew up playing Army, and that is a picture of me at three years old out wearing U.S. Army name tape, camo, hunting with my dad. Everything and anything in the outdoors. He was the, 
the the man I want to be, and I'm still learning from him. But that helped sort of inspire me to to want to enlist. That was a big part about my decision to enlist. But even before that, in middle school, actually, I think this was before middle school, I was repelling. Just as a little kid, I learned how to repel. Then as a middle school kid, I was repelling right alongside college ROTC students. And those students didn't want to go first. I'm like, y'all, I got this. I got this. I might be in middle school, but I'll show you how it's done. I was the first one going over that cliff there as well. And in high school, I played ice hockey. I spent four years on the varsity wrestling team. And as a team captain, toughness, determination, discipline, resilience were at my core. And so when it came time to really think about enlisting, it was just something that I always wanted to do. I always dreamed of doing. It was just, you know, making the decision was easy peasy. It was a matter of choosing active duty versus National Guard. And like I said, the way I saw it, National Guard gave me the best of both worlds. I got to do the running and gunning, rappelling, jumping out of helicopters, all that fun stuff. But I also got to be a college student and have a, quote, civilian life at the same time, or so I thought, until I got deployed. But it was a big part of my family. It really was. But then as I transitioned, though, I enlisted. I'm transitioning to military life. There were some challenges. It was scary. I'd never traveled alone. So as a 17, 18 year old, I'd never really traveled alone. Never been away from home for any extended period of time. I was sitting on a bus with strangers in the dark and I had to step off of that bus there at Fort Benning, Georgia. And it was go time, go time, meaning go here. Go there, sit there, don't do that. Get your hands out of your pockets. Y'all probably heard that one before, right? Basic training, the physical aspects were challenging, but I knew I was capable. The mental aspects were challenging, but I knew I was capable. But I could feel my identity being molded, being refined, and really being solidified and forged deep into my being. Because I was tra transforming from a high school kid into a soldier. Military life brought its own challenges though. In just one instance, I had the opportunity to attend air assault school, but I got sick as can be. I couldn't even hold down water. But at air assault school, if you miss a certain amount of time, they boot you out. They kick you out and you got to start right back over. But tapping into that new identity that I've been molded into that toughness, that discipline, that never quit mindset, I went to sick call. I was there for two hours. They gave me an IV in each arm and a shot in the hind end and then sent me straight out to that rappel tower because I was hardened. I was tough. Physical pain ain't got nothing on me. This was who I was. It was my identity, my being. I was now becoming one of those super soldiers that I watched in the movies as a kid growing up. I was being forged into one myself and that identity was oh so important. And that will be woven throughout today's session as well, how our service impacts. But it's just one piece of our identity as well. Because we all have our uniqueness around our identities. And the military service is just one component of that identity. When it comes to the call to serve, the service in the military really does attract individuals from a wide array of backgrounds. But we do share a common thread of courage, of commitment, of service. And we all have our own de decisions, our own factors that led us to decide to serve. Could be personal, societal, or even patriotic factors. And quite frankly, it's a, it's a multifaceted, dynamic, comprehensive decision to enlist, influenced by our personal values, our family tradition, economic opportunities like free college, even down to a sense of just patriotism and wanting to really serve our country. But there's going to be a mix of those diverse motivations as well. It's going to be different across all veterans. But also, the military personnel come from every corner of the country and quite, oh, the globe, quite frankly, really representing its rich diversity. There's ethnic, cultural, and socioeconomic diversity, and that strengthens 
our military's global perspective and effectiveness as well. And this diversity really does enhance our operational effectiveness by bringing that wide array, that wide range of perspectives and skills to the table. But when you look to the backbone of our military, of those who serve, resilience, the ability to withstand, to adapt, to grow from challenges. We've got discipline, but that strong sense of duty that's honed through our rigorous, rigorous training. We've got the capacity to lead, to inspire, to bring out the best in others, regardless of their rank. We know how to work in a team, and we know that success is achieved not individually, but as a cohesive unit as well. And then many of us are motivated by a desire to protect, a desire to serve our country, and driven by that deep sense of patriotism as well. Whereas I've even heard folks say, you know, they have a strong desire to contribute, to play their part in global peace. So we're all bringing our different backgrounds, our different life experiences, different pieces of our unique identities to the table, battering our decision to serve and also influencing how we serve as well. And those individual factors are going to also help shape our individual experiences as well. We can talk about the SMVF population, but it's made up of unique individuals. That's something that I always, always want to remind folks like, yeah, it's great to you know put us in a box. Hey, Jason, you're a veteran. Dave, you're a veteran. That means y'all are the same, right? Same experiences, same stories, same successes, same strengths. Not necessarily. Because our experiences, our identities are going to be influenced by a variety of factors. Each of these elements contribute to the uniqueness of our challenges, but also to our needs and also to our strengths as well that we face, that we hone, that we strengthen during and after our military service. We're individuals first. We're individuals first. But then when we move into the SMVF layer, the service members, the veterans and their families, you know, being a member of the SMVF community, it, it inherently involves unique factors and experiences that do distinguish it from civilian life, right? And it comes down to military culture and lifestyle. Military's got its own values, its own culture, its own norms, and those do deeply influence service members and their families as well. You know, I talked about the backbone of discipline. We're also used to the hierarchical leadership, camaraderie, traditions, rituals as well. And I do have a link at the end where you can really go through some military culture training. Um, also got that link in the workbook as well for follow on resources. Then you've got deployments, combat exposure as well. They have profound impacts. These experiences can be facing a life-threatening situation, witnessing death or serious injury, the stress of being in a combat zone, but also a good little point to remember, not all deployments are combat related. Jason mentioned one in Macedonia. I went to Bulgaria to train with the Bulgarian army, not a combat deployment, but still a deployment that came with its own factors, its own stress, its own challenges as well. Then reintegration challenges. I'm going to unpack and share some very personal sides of my transition to coming back from my combat deployment and how I navigated those challenges. Not so well, but then much better as I learned and grew as well. And of course, there's the physical and psychological injuries, which I'll start to share some of my stories. They're related to PTSD, traumatic brain injury, depression, anxiety. Those all are uh, not uncommon in the SMVF population. And also quick note to those physical and psychological injuries don't have to be combat related. Training accidents, stresses. When I was at basic training, we were out on a field training exercise during a Georgia thunderstorm. Y'all know what those thunderstorms are like. I know lightning galore and our drill sergeants there, they were in their tent and their tent got struck by lightning and the guys that were leaning on the pole got burned. We, as the, the trainees had to respond and figure out how to call in for a, a, a helicopter medevac to come take care of them, fix them. Cause we were still learning. 
That's just the basic training. But we've got skills and experience, unique skills that we've developed that we can parlay into a civilian life as well. And oh my gosh, those frequent locations. I mean, Sarah talked a little bit about her relocations. Fun story. My sister married a fella in the Navy. They got married, moved from Virginia Beach, Virginia, uh, neighbors of Sarah, to all the way clear out to San Diego during their first year of marriage. Then a year later, they moved to Nor back to Norfolk, Virginia, coast to coast to coast. And then they went to South Korea. Then they went to Connecticut. Then they went back to Virginia. These frequent moves, relocations are also challenged and bring their own unique stressors. And that family separation, when I was deployed, the way that I'm able to articulate the stress that it put on my family, y'all, my mom wore two, two wrist watches for the entire year I was gone. So she always knew what time it was in Iraq because she was always thinking about me, always worried. And I'm pretty sure she didn't sleep a wink while I was deployed. That adds a whole nother layer, a whole other type of stress on our families as well. Oh, hey, number nine, what do we got here? So we talked a lot about the family relocations and, and, the moving and the challenges and the deployments. Jason, how can you leave your family for so long? Yeah. I mean, how, what an insensitive question to ask, right? Because asking the question, you know, there's, there's, there's a judgmental tone to that. There's this, this undercurrent of, of, you know, well, you're obviously not, you know, that invested as, as a dad or as a parent or as a sibling or as a whoever, um, it's just so, and it's not, in, even if it's not intended that way, um, it can be received that way. How could you leave your family for so long? Um, we gotta, words matter. Words matter. How we say and what we say matters. We gotta be, we have to check ourselves. We have to think about how it might land. Don't say this. How could you leave your family for so long? Mm. Don't do that. As if there was a choice. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a whole other story there. Yes. But as we continue to unpack the SMVF layer, got military widowhood, families of fallen service members. They face a whole unique set of grief, adjustment, challenges, along with navigating the benefits and support systems as well. A whole lot of stuff, not cool stuff for them to have to navigate. And I then, can share. Oh, yeah. sorry, Dave. I was yeah. just going to share something, especially if it's a loss by suicide um, within the military community. If you have family members that have loved ones that died in action, and then you have family members who have died by suicide, they somehow feel as if the lost survivors of suicide, their loved ones had a choice. And so there's still, even within the military community, those survivors and Gold Star family members, there is still, because of their individual pains and their individual circumstances, it's very challenging to understand. And even within the military community, it's not always that support that is received by the survivors and, and Gold Star families. So that is, is valuable wisdom, but also uncomfortable wisdom, knowing that that is real. That is real. Yes. Thank you. I, and I know that is very personal for you. And you've got that, that experience. So thank you for. For sharing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. The last bullet point that I've got up here is service related stigma and stereotypes. Y'all, I felt this hardcore when I came back. This was a big challenge for me. And I still wrestle with it a little bit too. Now that I'm sharing my voice more and more about my experience as a veteran, I still feel pressure, stereotypes, and, and even stigma. Here And one of the biggest ways that this made, made its appearance was through language. That's why we have the top 10 that we're talking about language, the power of language. We may not even realize it, but stigma is a son of a, 
and oh so real. Hey, number eight, what do we got? What do we got? So Dave, why do you need help? Aren't you trained to be tough? Oh, yes, I am trained to be tough. I am. This makes it hard for me to not want to reach out for help. But this disregards the human aspect, that individual identity that I bring to service. It disregards the whole aspect of y'all. You are a human being. You're a human being. So experiences are absolutely going to have an impact. Doesn't matter if you're trained to be tough or not. And I'll actually share a few stories from combat a little bit later on how this, I struggled with this being mentally, physically tough, but also having these things called emotions and needing help and not knowing what to do with them other than put them in a box, which is not healthy. When it comes to being a reservist during the National Guard, I was in the Guard. The members of the Guard face that dual role of being a civilian, having a civilian job and their military responsibilities. Then you get deployed. That adds a whole new level of unique stressors. Their jobs back home. For me, it was college going on without me. I got back just in time to watch all of my friends graduate, which would have been, should have been my graduation day as well. But I got deployed and I was missing out. I was being left behind on campus. When it comes to children, children and military families also face unique challenges like adapting to new schools, frequent relocation, integrating into new communities, having to make new friends, coping with a parent's deployment or absence as well. Now, all of these factors are meant to just highlight the complex and multifaceted nature of being a part of the SMVF community. So as we really grow to really deepen our understanding of those unique aspects, it's essential for us to be able to effectively support and interact with our service members, our veterans, and their families as well. And, you know, Jason, I know you've got a, a good, good example, uh, a good analogy of what it's like leaving your family, leaving your job, going on a deployment, coming back. Can you hit us with that story? Because also I, I need a water break. It's, it's story time. It's story yes. time. All right. So, yeah, I live in northern Minnesota. K kick it over to the next slide, if you would. I live in northern Minnesota, where one of the many uh, recreational op opportunities we would have available to us is this, canoeing. We can jump in the canoe. We have some beautiful canoeing areas, some designated water or wildlife canoeing areas. The Boundary Waters is a spectacular venue. Now, if you've been on a canoe, in a canoe, especially if you've been on a canoe trip, where you're you're canoeing to go camping or fishing and you've got all your gear and your stuff and you're 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 out there. Everyone in the canoe has a very specific role. And within that role, there are certain tasks and duties that they fulfill. If you're if you're in the bow of the canoe, if you're in the front of the canoe, you're kind of you're kind of the powerhouse. You're providing just momentum, energy, moving the boat forward. You're not concerned about navigation or steering the boat. You're just you're just paddling. You can switch up occasionally based on the wind or whatever, but you're just providing the path. If you're on the back of the canoe, well, you're mo you're steering this boat. You're doing so with certain strokes and different things. You're navigating and you are you are steering the vessel, right? And you're providing some direction to the others in the canoe about what side you'd like them to paddle on and whatnot, but you have a specific role. If you're in the middle of the canoe, we would call that a duffer. If you're in the duffer seat or if you're in the middle of the canoe, you generally aren't paddling, but you have other obligations. You might be doing the navigation. You've got the map in front of you, the GPS. Um, you're out, you're a lookout for certain things. You're keeping stuff in organ organized and, and, and tidy. Everyone in the canoe has a certain role. If you've ever been in a canoe and you've been out in the middle of the lake in a canoe and had the misfortune of having someone fall out of the canoe, you'll note that that's a pretty tricky operation. It can be tricky to have someone exit the canoe midstream, mid lake, without the entire canoe capsizing. And yet it can be done. You can have somebody get out of the canoe without it filling with water or tipping over. But only if everyone else in the canoe is ready for that and they know how to anticipate and lean a little bit the other way, but not too far to allow that person to get out of the canoe. And off they go and the canoe stays afloat. 
It's also possible out in the middle of the water to have someone re-enter the canoe. Now, when they've been out of the canoe, though, the people doing certain tasks had to reassign who's doing what. Because if we just lost our navigator, someone else needs to take over the compass and the map. If, if someone who was in the back of the canoe was steering, now the other people need to do the steering if that person exited the canoe, right? Duties had to shift and had to change. Getting them back in the boat is tricky. It can be done if the others who are still in it are anticipating that and they're prepared for that and they know how to best lean the other way without leaning too far to help them get back in the canoe without it swamping and tipping over. But once they're back in the boat, they probably think that they, they're going to resume the same roles and duties that they fulfilled before. But those duties have been picked up by somebody else. And so there's some more conversations that need to happen. Think of the canoe as your family. Think of the canoe as your family, your home, your household. Everyone in it has certain tasks and duties that they fulfill. They're doing certain things. Literally certain tasks, mowing the lawn, getting the garbage out, balancing the checkbook, whatever it may be, getting the kids to school. Having someone leave the family, leave the household for a deployment is tricky. It's delicate. It can be done without upsetting the balance too much, without that thing flipping over or swamping. But our best chances of doing it is this everyone's sort of prepared for that and they don't lean too far the other way. But once that family member exits the boat and off they go on their deployment, combat or not, those left in the, in, the, in the boat, those left in the home, have to pick up the tasks that that other person did, right? Now, other people have to drop the kids off or balance the checkbook or do the this or manage the that or discipline or deal with the report card or whatever. It's tough when they're gone, but a well-equipped family who's, who's, who's supported and, and ready for that, can manage that. Getting that person back in the boat is tricky too. Getting them back in without it tipping over can be delicate, but it can be done. Once they get back in the boat, though, they're going to think they've got the same tasks and responsibilities, but it can be weird because other people have picked them up. I love this analogy for me because, number one, it's visual it's real for me because I've been in these boats. Literally, I've been in canoes that have, that have had people fall out of them and tried to get people back in without swamping. So I can, I can put myself there. But I can also put myself there in a military context. Um, having, having experienced this with family members in the National Guard, having experienced this by having been in an active service and been deployed to different places and in and seeing my, my fellow soldiers who had families, I was single at the time, so I didn't experience that on the same deep of a level, but it, it landed for me to think of it in that way, that, that delicate and tricky, but can be done if we're prepared for it. If we have some preparation, if we're patient, if we anticipate, we, we react, but don't overreact to the exiting or the re-entering. Uh, so that's my story. Um, I, 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 again, I find some benefit in this analogy for myself. And when I'm talking to veterans and family members about their experiences and using this as an analogy and a visual to kind of put in some context and make people think about it at, at another level. So um, I'll just, I'll pause for, for reactions or maybe some of you have had similar experiences personally or, or, or collaterally in helping family members and how you've helped them navigate people getting in and out of their canoes. So I'll just pause and open up the, the floor for, for comments or, or reactions to that. Feel free to unmute yourself or, or drop into the chat. Bueller? Bueller? That's a Fort Paris Bueller reference that used to be funny 10 years ago. Oh, uh, well, I see some smiles. We don't right. get it. Right. It's landing. Yeah. It's landing. It still is very funny, by the way. <laughs> All right. What do you got for us, Sarah? <laughs> As a veteran, I've never heard it explained this way. And I think that's actually a very good way of explaining it. And it's very true. It is very hard to come back. It's very hard to navigate what your role is at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah. 
I've never thought about in the canoe because I'm not good at canoeing, but you know. <laughs> it's difficult though, right? It's difficult. And even some of these roles and duties and, and tasks or whatever that maybe you and your family didn't talk about who's covering it now, but it got picked up. It got covered because it needed to be. Um, exactly. And, it, and it's a, there's a weirdness when you come back and they re, you know, that family member re enters the canoe and it's, 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 it's tricky, right? Leslie, did I see you come off mute? I thought I saw somebody else on the participant list come off mute. I did. Ah, yeah. <laughs> it, I was started with an L. I was in the neighborhood. Yeah, I was going to say like, um, yeah, I can really relate to that. Um, being an Army and National Guard um, veteran, um, it's hard both ways. Like it was hard for me coming from being in a regular army to go into the National Guard. Um, it took me for the longest time to get adjusted just to that because um, the soldiers were calling each other by their first names and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like used to it. And I'm like, I'm, it's going to take me forever to learn everybody's names if everybody calling, you know, each other. And it was more, you know, tight knit, you know, a more tight knit family. So um, I had to get accustomed to that. But I'll tell you, um, I deployed and did more things with the National Guard than I did with the Army. So mm. um, it was a, as a being a um, Iraqi uh, freedom veteran, uh, I deployed to um, Iraq. And coming back, it was like, you know, I'm telling you, like, it's almost like you're missing something, you know? Like, um, you feel like you should be doing something, but at the same time, you you might feel withdrawn for want to be do things that you did before. So um, that's that's my story. I was kind of withdrawn at first and really didn't know why. Um, I just wanted to be by myself, and just like the simplest thing, like the simplest noise, would um, irritate me. So I had to work with those issues, you know, getting back to being, you know, who I, you know. Going back to realize who you were before you left. So um, that could be totally different. So that's my experience. Well, thank you so much for yeah. sharing that. Thank you. And yeah, I, I appreciate you pointing out this transition from active army to National Guard. I, I experienced a lot of the same struggles. Like, yeah, the first name thing killed me. Like, what? You can't just call someone Bob. You know, you walk through the border pool and morning, Bob, hey, Joe, hey, Larry. And it's like, that's the first sergeant. You can't, someone, you should be doing push-ups right now, right? Where's the discipline? Where's the thing? It was, it, it boggled my mind. But uh, yeah, those deployments are, are tough. That's tough stuff. That's, that's, uh, that's adjustment time for everybody. 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 Yeah. I love this. Yeah, Dave pointing out in the, in the chat, <laughs> some of the cultural things that happen while you're away. Mm -hmm. Like Facebook. I had no idea what that was when I came back. Everybody assumed, like, yo, Facebook, what in the world is that? I Facebook. felt so lost and behind and unconnected. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Thank you all for sharing your own personal sort of challenges, stressors that, that you experienced. And that really is going to take us into our next sort of block of content, our next conversation around specifically pointing out what are some of the risk and protective factors. And you know, we've shared, you know, a little bit about who serves the, the multifaceted identities within the SMVF community. We unpacked many of the layers of that identity and want to, to pause and just put you into breakout rooms and want you all to have a conversation and start to kind of identify, point out, call out some of those risk and also those protective factors that that you heard in in our for our first block of content, and then when you come back, going to do a, just a report out by breakout room. Just what's one thing you want to share with us as the large group? All right, so just start to uncover, name some of those risk and protective factors that you have have heard us talk about, or that you have experience with as well. And we're going to put you in there for a total of seven minutes, six minutes, and then a 60 second countdown timer. All right. We'll see you in a few.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back to the main Zoom room. All right. So we're just, like I said, going to go by breakout room. Just, you know, what's one thing that you talked about that you want to share with the rest of us here? Just one little tidbit, one little, little nugget. And actually, we'll start off with room one. Dr. Tolbert, Julie, what's something you might want to, to share with us? All right, we'll come back. I know Dr. Tolbert was going to have to bounce around. Oh, you're okay. Right. You're right. Yeah. I know you're busy. So if you had to step out, no sweat. We can circle back and no worries. Okay, so what was the question, Dave? I'm sorry. Guess, yeah, no worries. Yeah. So just one thing you wanted to share with the large group after your conversation in the breakouts as it relates to risk or protective factors. Um, and so when I think about like the risk and protective factors for um, veterans specifically, mm -hmm. um, I heard you talk about the separation from your family, you know, from that support system during that time. So I thought about that as being maybe one of those those risk factors. Yes. And then um the protective factors, I just off the top, I would think about spirituality during that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I think I, I was in the that. breakout alone. So oh didn't have okay. <laughs> totally putting you on the spot then. Whoops. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for sharing that wisdom with us. Yeah. Okay. Let's venture on to room two. Room two. Latasha, Chris, Charmaine, Ali Alika, please correct me. Tell me how to say your name properly. Because what would you all like to sort of share with us? We talked about, um, you know, support um, in that transition period, you know, it, it, you going to work um, that now that now um, we do have some more supports in place in our area, but traditionally mm -hmm. there hasn't been. Um, and we talked about that, you know, our families can be a risk and a protective factor. Uh, um, and I, I kind of stole from one of your um, presentations that I've seen, you know, that we have to focus on the veteran, but we also have to focus on the family too, because it's a huge transition for, for all of the above. Um, and one of the one of the kind of hurdles that I've encountered lately, we um, recently uh, a gentleman, an older gentleman that I know that we're both in the same association. We have some veteran associations here, and and we have a lot of um, our cities are very committed to um, veteran associations and that and support. But um, he needed some treatment, and we so he went to the local clinic here in Lake Charles, and they told him he would have to go to the one in Jenny's because that's where he was registered at. I was like, can't you, it's the federal government. Why can't you just transfer? So anyway, yeah. that was, that was something that I just, you know, peaked my ears, uh, as a, and I, and I kind of asked a little bit around and, uh, other people have told me, yeah, that that's basically what we've been told to is our paperwork will get lost in the shuffle. And so, you just need to stay where you're at. That is a, a very real challenge. Switching from VA region to VA region does bring uh, a lot of headaches and risk factors there as well. And I, I do like how you articulated that family can be both a risk or a protective factor. There's a lot to that that we can also unpack a little bit later as well. Yeah. Thank you, room two. Thank you, room two. What about room three? Alicia, Dustin, Jamie, Megan, what kind of wisdom you want to share with us? Go ahead, Dustin. Hey, this is Dustin. Um, I think that as far as the risk factors, the stigma to asking for help. Uh, when we lost somebody in combat, we kind of suffered in silence. And it was like nobody wanted to talk about mental health. It was viewed more as a weakness. And um, I know the risk is that we... We drank when we were happy and we drank when we were sad. And I mean, we drank when we got off work. That's really, we drank a lot. And uh, I think protective uh, factors, the service work and being a part of something greater is uh, really made a difference in my life recently. Yeah. I feel those. Yeah. Megan, did I see you come off of mute also? Something you wanted to share? No, I was just going to share that. 
I accidentally abandoned my breakout group. <laughs> oh, no worries. We're all still here together. All right. All right. Well, thank you, room three. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's make a pit stop in room four as well. Alicia, Leslie, Rochelle, Sarah. What y'all come up with? Sarah, did you want to share or Alicia? The good old nose goes when your cameras are on. Not it. I can't go to Miss Leslie. Uh, we talked about uh, reacclimating and the loss of friends when you come back because they've not went anywhere and you had and you've seen things that you cannot discuss. You know, done things you cannot discuss and they never understand it. And the fact that when you come back, your family may be different. Yes, indeed. That that tippy canoe. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to add to um to Sarah that the um lack of resources, we spoke about that. And I found that that was really interesting, but I do see it for myself. And I'm non military, but I've seen that lack of resources was a risk factor. Yes, lack of resources or even knowing how to navigate the resources that even might exist. Yeah. All right. Y'all shared some solid wisdom, solid wisdom and bringing your own perspectives, your own experience, your own insights to the table and really starting to uncover that there are also protective factors. I'm glad that some of y'all mentioned that, that there are protective factors. I feel and we'll carry this thread throughout as well that we, we focus solely on those risk factors or focus intensely on the risk factors and not as much on those protective factors to really, really build them up. And stigma, stigma was brought up. Stereotypes, generalizations. Yes. This, I, this will get me feeling anxious because it takes me right back to one of the the biggest challenges that I faced was stigma. And we started off our time together really understanding that within the SMVF community, everyone is an individual with their own unique experiences, both service-related, but then also not service-related. And understanding those individual aspects, respecting our diverse experiences are, are quite frankly, what I would classify as the most, the most, most important thing to be mindful of when it comes to engaging, when it comes to serving, when it comes to, to supporting the SMVF community, understand, respect, embrace, empower the individuality of all of our identities, all of our unique experiences because they're all going to be so different and having that respect, valuing our journeys and be open, engaging and non-judgmental when you interact, when you're serving, when you're supporting veterans. And when it comes to statistics, y'all, like it is way too clear, like too many of us are suffering in silence. I mean, Dustin mentioned that I felt that that was me. That was my story. For many years, three, four years, where I suffered in silence, and up to twenty percent of veterans returning home with symptoms of PTSD. Stigma still keeps many, far too many of them, from seeking help that they desperately need. And this isn't just a personal issue; it's something that we all, as community members, can do. We can shift and change the narrative. We can change how we view. And how we talk about mental health, recovery, prevention, and the SMVF community. Because it is all so real. Sarah, what is this one? What is number seven on our list? Oh, God. Excuse me. Number seven. Did you even see real action? Oh, my gosh. Y'all, like, I got this one. Because I was in the guard. I was in the National Guard. Like, psh, Did you even see real action? Like, what? This felt like so belittling. When you ask 
a service member this, you are belittling their role. You're belittling their experiences in service. And I would get fired up and be like, y'all, we actually took over our first sector. We took it over from the 101st Airborne, the prestigious 101st Airborne. I earned five combat patches in a one-year deployment. I trained Iraqi army soldiers. And for those that have seen the movie American Sniper with Chris, talking about Chris Kyle's legacy, his story, that enemy sniper that he was hunting in that movie, I was hunting that same sniper. We were all going after that fellow because he was having such a profound, just a terrible impact on our troops. So did you even see real action? You bet your hiney I saw real action. I was blown up my first week in country. First week in country, just getting a tour of our sector. And I got hit with an IED and blown up. So you betcha I saw real combat. How do we navigate this military culture? That came up earlier, what folks are really wanting to talk about and understand. Jason, how do we, how, do how we can we go about you? Let's yeah. talk navigation. Navigation yeah. is a term and a skill that those of us who have served are intimately familiar with. Navigation. Shoot, move, and communicate. You got to be able to move. You got to be able to know where you're going. So I remember back to my service. So I served in, in, you know, in the early 90s. I was stationed in Germany for almost all of it in the 3rd Infantry Division. There I am. I'm in that little, that little red oval there. That's that little very youthful looking Jason Anderson sitting there as a private first class on the front of a... M88 recovery vehicle. I was a, I was a Bradley mechanic. So I was a wrench. I, I turned gears. I was a grease monkey. And, um, but I remember so vividly that the, the army at that time, I'm sure they still do this for those non-combat arms jobs. So I, I was a mechanic, but every Thursday morning they had what was called sergeant's time or, or in the third ID, we call it marm time, um, where the, the morning of Thursday mornings were dedicated for training of basic soldier skills to keep it fresh because we're all infantry first, right? We all have to be able to shoot, move, and communicate. So we would be retrained on first aid things or deploying a claymore mine or whatever. But on this particular Thursday morning, I was brand new. I'd been in the unit for like a week. I was brand new right out of training, 18 year old kid. And the topic that day, our platoon sergeant was teaching us nighttime land navigation. The nighttime land nav was the topic of the day. And so we're all huddled around in the motor pool as he's teaching us this course and he's going on and on, you know, platoon sergeant, super, you know, super authoritative. He was pretty, pretty uh, assertive in his leadership. And as he's talking to us about this, the nuances of nighttime land navigation, he says to us with, with all the confidence in the world of, that an E7 platoon sergeant would have, he says, no, of course, you know. That if you are in the Northern Hemisphere and you are disoriented at night and you have the luxury of a clear night sky, if you look across the, the, the landscape of the sky and the stars above and you find the Big Dipper, if you find the Big Dipper and you know this constellation, you can find this constellation, all you got to do is find the Big Dipper because the star that makes up the very end of the handle of the Big Dipper is the North Star. And therefore, you now have North if you don't have a compass. And I'm hearing him say this, and I look kind of nervously to my left, to my right, at my other soldiers that I don't really even know yet because I'm a brand new kid. And I'm waiting for someone to correct him because I know it. I know he's wrong. North Star is not in the Big Dipper. And nobody says anything. So finally, I, I raised my hand and said, Platoon Star. He says, yeah, Private. Well, what is it, Private? What do you got? I said, well, Platoon Star, you... You, you may have misspoke because I, I believe you just said that the, I, I believe you just said that the North Star is in the Big Dipper. And that's, that's not, that's not entirely accurate, Toon Star. And I said, it's actually in the Little Dipper. I said, the Big Dipper is Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And if you took the two end stars that comprise the scoop of the Big Dipper, and if you went five times their distance in a straight line, you would find Polaris, the North Star, which makes up the end of Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper constellation. And so I, I, I explained this to him just, just verbally, like I just did to you. And he looks at me, he's like, private, you are so wrong. You are so wrong. It kind of, he didn't say this, but he was implying like, how dare you question my knowledge of nighttime land navigation? And he says, somebody find a field manual. Someone find this manual. We got to find this, 
to prove my, I'm right. And he says, while you're looking, Private Anderson, I want you to know you got, we got 20 push-ups riding on this. Now, I know I'm right. I know I'm right. So finally, someone finds field manual and they find this diagram, right? This diagram. And they show it to him with a kind of a bit of a snicker. And he looks at it and he goes, I'll be damned. And he drops down and looks up to me and says, count them off. And has me count while he does 20 push-ups. Now, this is one of the first times I've ever met this man. And I'm a private e nothing. And I'm thinking, what damage have I just done for myself here? And uh, anyways, he takes it with humility, does his push-ups. We go on with the course. We go on with life. The next day, I'm, I'm kicking through the motor pool. I got to go into the office to get parts or get a manual or something. And then, and there he is sitting behind his desk. And as I'm getting my stuff, he says, oh, hey, Private Anderson, right? Private Anderson, come on in here. Let me learn a little more something about you. He says, that was, um, that was pretty cute. That little thing you did there yesterday with the training and the, and the, the constellations and all that. Let's tell me a little bit more about yourself. So where, where are you coming to us from? I said, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm from Minnesota. It's the, uh, it's the North Star state. So. We had a great, we had a great kickoff to our relationship. It was just hunky dory after that. Land, navigation is important in navigation and how we navigate these conversations, how we navigate these relationships, how we navigate gaps in services, how we navigate stigma is an important part of not just this training. It's an important part of our work. So that's where we're going next. We're going to talk navigation. How do we navigate our way through this stuff? So with that, though, we continue on with another thing. Number six. So Dave, you've shared a lot of experiences and stories. You must really miss the excitement of being in combat. Right, right. I was definitely in combat. But when you, you say this to a veteran, it, it overlooks the complexities that is combat, that is service and its impacts. Yes, I was in combat. Yes, there were adrenaline dumps. But at the same time, there was this flood of different emotions that I didn't understand that I had to work through and were, were so confusing. There's also the concept of moral injury as well that comes right alongside with, with combat interactions, engagements, experiences too. So when you say this to a, a veteran, you are just dismissing all those other potential emotions, challenges, experiences as it relates to their own unique combat experience. And yeah, Dustin, what you got for us? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a statement with the technology advances. Um, I mean, I was in, I was in Iraq in the middle of it, but I know veterans who were dealing with unmanned. Uh, aerial vehicles. So they saw, they saw the same things and like the, the injuries that they are dealing with now are real. And I mean, they, they dealt with it from, you know, in the States. Yes. Uh, the drone pilots. Yes, absolutely. That, that was, yeah, I was, I was in Oh five. I did not get to experience that, but that is also so very real. Absolutely point that out for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Big impacts. All right. We've been chatting for a while, but I think we could all use a little coffee break. What do you say? We'll go ahead and pick back up with our recording and navigation. Navigation, navigation. Y'all brought it up this morning when we asked you what we were looking forward to talking about today. But when it comes to navigating military culture, y'all are already well on your way. I know we've got veterans in the audience also, so you've got you to gotta step ahead because it really starts with educating yourself on military structure and, and values and familiarizing yourself, ranks, branches, significance of medals, awards, understanding the backbone, duty, honor, courage, deployments, active duty, National Guard. And I mentioned before too, I'll be putting a link in the chat, but then also in your workbook, there's a link to where you can get specific free online training that really unpacks and dives into understanding military culture even more. It's a lot of information. 
but then also recognizing and respecting individual experiences. Guess what? That's what we've been talking about the entire first half of today's session, because it really is important to understand about the general aspects, but you've got to, again, recognize each member's unique experiences. Don't make those assumptions. Don't make those assumptions. And then also you're doing it right now, building your cultural confidence, cultural humility as well, seeking out training programs, workshops, other veterans to connect with and learn from, and then that supportive environment, which really starts with acknowledging and respecting the military backgrounds of service members, veterans, and their families as well. That's where it starts. But how are veterans perceived? And when we think about that, talked about the individual aspects of our identities, talked about some of those common commonalities in our our service-connected, service-related identities. But how are veterans perceived? So as we move forward in our conversation today, really working to deepen our knowledge and understanding of the veteran experience, we're gonna we're gonna shift to an aspect that really shapes our our reintegration, our coming home, our rejoining civilian life. It's the perception that veterans have within our society, within our communities as well. And this is yet another complex, complex interwoven tapestry of, of societal views, community views, stereotypes that we as veterans encounter every day. And I want you to think about this. We are often perceived, often viewed through a contrasting dual lens. On one hand, we're seen as revered heroes. We're celebrated for our bravery, for our sacrifices. But then on the other side, we're often perceived as victims, struggling with the aftermath of our service and in need of rescue, in need of rehabilitation. This dichotomy, this dichotomy is rather, rather significant and it's influenced by media. It's influenced by conversations. And those conversations kind of, again, oscillate between glorifying the valor, the heroism associated with military service, and highlighting the challenges that veterans face when we return to civilian life, including mental health issues and, and the adjustment to, to life outside the military. It seems like every, every military movie I see shows a veteran coming home, struggling with PTSD, broken down, sitting at the bar drinking, can't be around his family. But those portrayals in the media and pop culture contribute to public perception that, that may not fully capture the, the diversity and the complexity of our experiences. They kind of, they kind of oversimplify the realities of our lives. That leads I'm gonna, to, I'm sorry yeah, to step yeah. line there, Dave. I'm going to add to that yeah. about, you know, these, these stereotypes and stigmas that, you know, there's all coming from all these different sources. Yeah. With the media and the narrative and how we talk, we as veterans contribute to this too. We contribute to this as well. I remember just a few months ago, I was visiting with a, um, with an Iraqi war vet and and he's had some struggles. He's really worked through some stuff, but he, and he's super involved in, in his local, um, BFW organization. He's really, really involved in that. But he said something to me that just, he said it just as a matter of fact. He says, well, I tell you one thing that I know for certain. Any veteran who says that they don't think about suicide every day is lying. They're lying. He said this. And I'm like, oh, brother, you, you're hurting and you've been through some stuff, but that's just not true. And, and, and this was a message that he carries in the community. From a, from a healthy heart. I mean, he's meaning well. He's, he's, he's saying this from a space of, hey, we got people out there that might be on the surface, look like they're doing okay, but, that, but they, they aren't necessarily. But he's painting with the broadest brush in the world and saying every veteran thinks about suicide. I'm like, dude, it's not true. It's not true. So we, these stigmas are coming from a lot of sources, including from our, even ourselves. Absolutely. Our, our perceived stereotypes that we, we perceive and a lot of that was shaped in my childhood, the movies I watched, the, the stories I heard from my father and, you know, these stereotypes, they, 
these perceptions, like I said, oversimplify the realities and they don't necessarily take into account our resilience, our skills, our contributions that we make both in our service, but then also outside as well. And this simplification, it creates a substantial gap in understanding. The civilian population just looks at those two lenses, those two ends of the spectrum, but there's a whole lot of life in between there, a whole lot of individual, a whole lot of person individual in there as well. And this gap, this gap in understanding really is going to affect how we as a community interact with veterans and their families and service members. It's going to influence everything from policymaking down to your individual conversations with them as well. And that's why it is oh so important to, to adopt a more nuanced, more tailored, more informed approach in our perceptions, in our interactions with veterans. Back to acknowledging the breadth of our experiences as veterans, recognizing not only the challenges, but recognizing the strengths, the skills, and the potential. We can start to bridge that gap. And this approach, really focusing on bridging that gap, creates a more inclusive dialogue. And that dialogue is going to be one built on profound respect. And it's going to value the contributions of our service members, veterans, and families, both in and out of uniform, are going to help foster a community that supports a smooth and respectful transition from military to civilian life. And that dual lens that, that we see, that we are perceived, that's going to really contribute to the stigma and the, the perceived stigma that we as veterans feel. That's going to be that huge barrier to accessing help. When, when I'm pigeonholing myself or my peers pigeonhole me into those narrow categories, those stereotypes, it kind of invalidated the complexity of the experiences, those feelings or emotions that I was, I was trying to understand and made it even harder and more fearful for me to, to reach out and seek help because I, I wasn't going to fit the quote mold that folks were looking at me as that they thought I should fit into those societal expectations to conform, to be that hero. It's going to discourage me from, from sharing those, those vulnerabilities, which once I finally did, I was empowered and I found strength in my, my vulnerabilities. And then flipping it to that, that victim narrative, that can also make us reluctant to seeking help due to fears of, of being perceived as weak, incapable of coping. Those stigmas can become internalized and again, deter us from accessing help as well. And so as we continue this conversation, I, I want to, to encourage you to continue to stretch your minds and look beyond those, those binary perceptions and really look to understand the individual stories of the veterans that you serve, the veterans in your community as well, to really recognize the diverse needs, the rich experiences and skills and wisdom that they bring to our communities as well to really create that, that supportive and empathetic community that truly does honor the service and the sacrifices of our service members, our veterans, and their families. This is something I, I hope you can hear the passion in my voice. I could go on and on for this, but we got to pause. And I, I'm curious, what is number five? What is the number five thing not to say to a veteran? So Dave, was it worth it serving in the military and, and going to war? I got asked this countless times, the, the political drama behind the Iraq invasion, the Iraq war, asking me my feelings of politics, WMDs, all that, was it worth it? That is so personal, so complex, and so dynamic. It, it almost even discounts my, my choice to serve and protect our country, saying, oh, I was just there as a political pawn. Discount, discounts my service to our country to protect our freedom. And so was it worth it or not also makes me choose between the, the pain, the struggles, the challenges of serving, of combat as well. So don't say that. Don't say that to a veteran. And also with that too, as we transition to even more personal level, the aspects of 
of the veteran experience when, when we return home, when we change roles, going from active to guard, come back from a deployment, combat deployment, we carry with us what I call the invisible uniform. And I use this as a metaphor because it represents those experiences, those habits, those routines, those memories that are, are so deeply ingrained in, in us through our service. And unlike the physical uniform that, you know, you can take that uniform off, crinkle it up, throw it in the corner, throw it through the wash. This invisible uniform, it's hard to take off. It's going to accompany us as we step back into civilian life. And that life can feel unfamiliar. It feels heavy, confusing. And we're missing the structure. We're missing the camaraderie of military life. We're searching for our place within a society that many of us don't fully understand the weight of what we carry. What comes with that invisible uniform? as well. And for me, this was stepping back into college. I got back May of 2006, the day that my classmates graduated. And I told you that would have been my graduation ceremony as well, had I not been deployed. I got there in time to watch all of my friends leave. I felt alone. I'd just spent a year with guys watching each other's backs 24-7. We were always together. I had guys by my side on the good days on the bad days, on those okay days. We had our routines. We had our mission prep. We had our patrol route. We had our checks, our inspections. We had structure. We had order. They're on campus, gone. No friends, no support, no structure, no routines. I was older than my classmates. And I wasn't just your typical student anymore. I was very different. I felt like I was out of place. Not only did I not fit in, but I felt like I didn't belong there. I felt like I didn't belong. And those feelings weren't even taking into account my trauma, my PTSD, my traumatic brain injury as well. Like, what do I even talk to people about? What's okay to share? What's not okay to share? How? How do I even explain what it was like? If I share, doesn't that just make it even more clear that I don't belong, that I don't fit in? Oh, this, all of this was oh so stressful and confusing and made me feel so out of place, so much more like I didn't belong. And I didn't have that support network at all. I didn't. It's that invisible uniform that we carry with us. Number four. So, Jason, I just took this really great training on military culture, and now I totally understand what you went through. This is, this is a nerve for me when people would say this. They would, well-intended though they may be, to try and come alongside, and whether it's coming from a place of empathy or whatever, but it always, and I was never in combat. I was never in war. I never had rounds coming down range at me. Um, but when people would say things like this, even, even when I would coming out of training, come out of basic training and you get home on leave for the first time and you're with your buddies and you're, you're recounting some of the rigors and some of the stresses. And, and I didn't have good friends of mine say, Oh dude, I totally get that because you know, I mean, it sounds like football camp, like, right. Two a days. Like, I know what you're talking about, brother, because I, I did two a days of football camp, hell, a total hell. So I get it. Like, dude, no, you didn't. You didn't. You didn't leave your whole world, and and you know, completely remote from family and support and friends and and in your home. And this is not the same experience. This is not the same experience. So don't don't tell me that you know what I've been through because you just haven't. And we don't need to say things like this to to acknowledge that. Wow, you've been through some stuff, right? You've been through some stuff. But that whole notion of I. Totally know what you get through or went through. Analogous to this, it comes it comes up in my mind when people say that a sort of a thing like this, or folks who said that they, you know, you know, I almost enlisted. Yeah, I almost served too. So they're kind of implying that, you know, what you and I, kindred spirits, like we, because I almost I almost enlisted too. The difference between somebody who almost enlisted and somebody who never even thought of enlisting, they, neither one of those 
people served. So you don't, you didn't have the same experience. So let's just set that aside. The other thing that drives me crazy, this you can just tell I'm revved up about this one, is when people would say something along the lines of, um, you know what? I, yeah, I chose to not serve. Um, but if I did, I would have been a Navy SEAL. Like I would have been a Green Beret, I think. I think I would have gone Marine Recon if I'd have served. You know, I would have been, I'd have done special forces. That's like saying, you know, I never played football as a kid, but if I did, I would have been in the NFL. I'd have been a, a an all-star linebacker. I mean, I, I played flag football in seventh grade, but that's all I ever did. But if I had chosen to pursue the sport, I know I would have been a stud star. Anyways, <laughs> don't say this. Don't say this. I got to throw it. You like know what you've been through. I got to throw in two that for me, I didn't really understand what I went through. So how in the world could somebody else understand it? I still am trying to understand what I went through. So it's like, wait, you understand it, but I don't. Still okay, something's going on here. Something's going on here. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. So it's time for another activity to harvest the wisdom because y'all are smart. We've got veterans in the room. We've got those that serve veterans in the room. And so... We're going to do a round. We're going to put you in breakout rooms for 12 minutes. We've got a Google Doc. It's linked in the workbook, but I will also put the link in the chat box for you as well. And if somebody's not able to access it, no worries. Only one person in your breakout room really needs to have access to the Google Doc and you can screen share, but I'll show you what it is. It is meant to be a guide and get it up here on the right screen. So along the left-hand side, you'll see the shortcut menu navigation. When you enter your breakout room, we've got three breakout rooms. So the groups are a little bit larger this time. You'll see shortcuts where you can jump to whichever room you are in. Feel free. Literally, you can use any of these rooms. They're all the exact same. Jot your names down in here and just have a conversation around what are some do's and don'ts for engaging veterans. And as you go through, have your conversation, use this space to capture some of those thoughts, capture some of those learnings, those notab notable, quotable takeaways, insights. Use this template as a guide for your conversation. What do you know about do's and don'ts for engaging veterans? What are some, yeah, I never thought about that, or woo, that, yeah, that makes sense, or oh my gosh, Dr. Tolbert dropped an, uh, an amazing, beautiful quote. Make sure that. Put that right here. And then lastly, grab some of those ideas that are worth sharing and bring those back to the room for us as well to help educate us, share with us what are some of those hardened, learned lessons, those do's and don'ts as it relates to engaging, supporting veterans as well. All right. Everybody in the Google Doc that needs it, we're going to do... A total of 12 minutes. We'll do like last time, just a quick little report out by breakout room. Just what's that idea worth sharing? It's time for y'all to capture that wisdom. All right. And yeah, if for some reason you're not able to log into the Google Doc, that's okay. Again, if somebody in your breakout room is able to get into the Google Doc, they can be the type, the typer for you, the recorder for you, and put the information on the Google Doc. We'll work together. See you in a few. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, that was a shared Google Doc. So we're kind of following along, and it looked like uh, y'all ran out of time. Never enough time, right? <laughs> Never enough time. <laughs> uh, Want to just go down the, the Google Doc here by room and invite somebody from your room to just kind of share, you know? What were some of those ideas that you'd like to share with us? Those notable, quotable thoughts, big aha moments. Room one, room one, who would like to give voice to, to share the wisdom y'all captured? I will. This is Jamie. I will, since I took the notes, um, uh, hopefully I can encompass everything. Of course, we talked about being relatable and uh, not acting like you understand. And we had um, an individual in here who even talked about her interactions and 
how she would now incorporate that, which is one of the things as someone who speaks to individuals in crisis, how you say, I understand. So yeah, I think that put a different perspective on her approach and, and what to say. Um, uh, we also had um, a provider that indicated that, um, you know, she always wonders in uh, in her interactions, does she have enough resources? So for our aha moments, um, you know, uh, one of those was everyone's experience uh, was the same, you know, which is a fallacy. Uh, so uh, that was a it's pretty poignant for me, myself, that, you know, just ensuring that we don't generalize. We also lucked out in our group that we had an SMVF liaison and um, an assist trainer in our group and both shared their email addresses because both have um, resources that are available to us, um, which, uh, I was unaware of. So, uh, you know, I think that others in my group wasn't aware of. And then our ideas that were worth sharing was take advantage of the strengths and the experiences that the veterans have. Um, you know, uh, uh -oh. but also just overall utilizing their strengths. They learn leadership and other skills while being in the military that, um, you know, can transfer to uh, the civilian uh, side. So, you know, just taking advantage of those. And then the others were questions that you guys have not necessarily um, touched on yet, which you may, but um, one of our um, veterans uh, talked about how she was asked, um, she's been asked in the past, you know, did you kill anyone? And how, um, you know, that must be, while it's not even gauche to ask, well, it is really gauche to ask that. It's just, I can imagine that it is so triggering to even ask about experiences. And also we had um, another mom outside myself in the group and People, um, she is often asked, why did you let, in quotation marks, your kids join? So those are some things that we talked about and, um, you know, found that they were worthy of conversation. We we were talking while you're all in breakouts, like we need to just take our list from top 10 and just add to it because there are so many different things. So yeah, we're, we may have to borrow those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, it sounds like a wonderful conversation. Would have loved to have been a, a part of that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Anybody else? See if, no? All right. All right. So groovy, groovy, solid wisdom, solid conversations, and solid ideas worth sharing. Thank you, room one. Yes, indeed. And we have to come back and talk a little bit more about your liaison, your SMVF liaison and some of those resources. There might be some... Uh, Potential to share that with the rest of the community here as well. Let's jump to room two. Who from room two wants to to just uh, highlight what y'all talked about? Okay, I will go for room two. Uh, yeah. In our room, we were very fortunate to have uh, Miss Womack, who is our deputy Assist assistant secretary for the Office of Behavioral Health. Um, so, uh, she, it, it was, we were happy to have her there as well as Megan, who's from the Department of, um, Corrections from the DOC. I believe I got that right, Megan. But, um, and she gave us a lot of information as well because we are more on the administrative side, um, as opposed to actually being in the field. So she was able to give us, uh, give us some information. And one of the things that she talked about is how, it's easy for people to get the diversity that is in the military. It's not just monolithic. It's, it's, it's diverse there. Um, and not only do we deal with just the, with the veterans, but also with the families as well. So to think about both of, both of those uh, entities. But looking at the era of service, because people have different experiences based on the era in which they served. And that was also a, a moment for us 
because we don't necessarily think about the difference um, the younger uh, servicemen versus the older. We just kind of lump them all together. Um, so that was a, a moment for us too. Um, there were a lot of um, notable quotes, but the majority of them were just eye openers. You know, they were eye opening. Um, and the idea we're taking away from it was that uh, the generation gap between the service, you have generations of service members. Mm -hmm. And so um, their experiences are different. And so as the older generation of service members talk to the younger generations, sometimes there's a gap in, in the understanding of what they experience. Yes. So many nods, so much wisdom there. And yes, I don't forget the F in SMVF. Yes. SMVF. Right. Like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yes. That, and uh teaser, that's what next session is all about next week. We'll come back to unpack that a little bit more. All right. Thank you, room two. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Another wonderful conversation I wished I could have been a part of. Last stop would be room three. Who would like to share? Amanda. Um, yes. I was nominated right before we came into the group. So I didn't have a chance to repeat. Oh, <laughs> you hit us with your knowledge. Oh, yes. So we talked about, you know, the questions that people ask and not always understanding boundaries. Um, like, you know, the questions like, did you see combat? Um, I know how you feel. How could you leave your family? Um, we just discussed those things because it was just like people don't always understand boundaries and they, they feel as though, you know, just because they're able to share their life out, you know, just out in the open that everybody is willing to do that. And so, um, you know, just knowing that that's not always the case and that we need to think about things prior to, you know, having that discussion. Um, I've had moments, the assumption that people that are not veteran cannot relate to personal experiences to vets. Um, just having that that assumption that, okay, just because I, I didn't serve doesn't mean that I can't have that relation. You know, things might have happened within my life, some type of trauma to where, you know, I can relate to, to some of what it is that you might be feeling. Um, and let's see. Some of those notable quotes, um, or thoughts, the canoe tipping uh, was something that we wanted to know. And also, you know, whenever at the beginning, whenever we were throwing out words, um, feeling forgotten, uh, you know, that that's something that we wanted to kind of, you know, put out there because there are that that do feel forgotten. So we wanted to make sure that we, we made that um, clear. And ideas worth sharing, um, just understanding the do's and don'ts of what to say and what not to say, um, and then educating others on how to, you know, approach particular situations. So, yeah, a wonderful job reporting on Amanda. Thank you for stepping up and another wonderful conversation I would have loved to be a part of. And I just got to note, y'all, just in 10 minutes, the conversations you had the wisdom that you are able to, to capture, to articulate on this Google Doc is oh so powerful in just, just 10 minutes. And so I would encourage you to continue these conversations. And also, if you want to save this Google Doc, you can go to file and then make a copy and save it to your Google account or download it as a Word document as well to capture this wisdom, to hold onto this wisdom so it doesn't go away. Wonderful conversations. We're going to keep this conversation going because I know we're starting to wind down time just a little bit here. Oh, so we're back to this top 10 list. We're back to number three. What number, number three, Sarah? Jason, you're a veteran. You must have PTSD, right? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, it's one thing to to be sensitive to this and to, to um, be mindful of the, the possibility of it. And we've seen some stats, we know some statistics and numbers, and we know the disproportionate number of veterans that have this, but we can't be, we can't be painting with that broad brush. We can't be making assumptions about mental health. We, and in keeping with that, even when somebody is clearly demonstrating other, other dynamics, chemical dependency, as, as an example, we can't make an assumption that, oh, what's under that is PTSD. We don't know that. We don't know that. 
meet people where they're at and who they're who they are, not not based on any any assumptions. We got to be careful about that. Absolutely, absolutely. And so to touch on the the impacts of service, there's your physical impacts, injury, death. We're at risk of physical injuries from minor life threatening to combat to training exercises and and accidents. The threat of those improvised explosive devices, those IEDs. Then when it comes to mental and emotional as well, impacts of service, stress, anxiety, the high stress environment of service, of deployment, the constant threat of danger, trauma, PTSD, moral injury as well. You know, it's that deep, that deep rooted psychological impact that that comes from when you have to act or you witness events that that go against your moral compass, your moral beliefs or ethical beliefs that can have a big impact on your emotional and mental well-being. Then impacts of service as well, isolation, loneliness, relationship strain between deployments, being away from family and friends, and cognitive and psychological hypervigilance when I was deployed. I was oh so vigilant, always, always, always paying attention for things. That also comes with that decision fatigue. And then also unhealthy coping mechanisms. However, some, some veterans, some soldiers, some families do develop various strong, healthy coping mechanisms, whereas others tend to use not so healthy ways to, to deal with the stress and trauma that comes with military service and deployment. But then also, within the impacts of service, there's some positive resiliency in the heart of challenge. You know, we're able to, to experience profound growth in the most demanding situations imaginable. Within these moments, we can discover our true resilience. Then also that camaraderie that we experience, the relationships, the shared experience of the trust, the mutual respect. The camaraderie developed during service goes well beyond friendship. It goes into and creates a family. This sense of emotional belonging and unconditional support is invaluable. That's one of the things that I talked about missing when I came back to college. It's also important for the emotional well-being of each soldier. Also, serving expands our horizons. It's more than just a mission. It's a journey that that transforms our worldviews. We're able to acquire not just tactical skills, but a deeper understanding of the world, a global perspective, which is going to enhance, going to improve our problem solving, our leadership abilities as well. So we want to make sure we recognize the positive impacts as a role of serving as well, not just those not so positive, those negative impacts, those harms that can, can come with service. And for me, what this looked like for me when I was struggling with my undiagnosed traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, the stigma that I felt associated with that, my drinking, my, my addiction, I was there struggling in silence. And I was seeing messaging like this. I'm struggling. I'm carrying a weight. I've got this cloud of darkness hovering over me. I want to fit in. I want to feel like I belong. I want to feel like I have friends. I see this problem-focused messaging. All it tells me is that, oh yeah, I'm normal. I'm struggling. I'm suffering in silence. Ah, that's less normal. If I admit that I need help, I'll be even more part of the problem. I'll be giving in to the stereotype that I was trying so hard to avoid. The stereotype that I'm broken. The stereotype that I'm a crazy veteran. The stereotype that I'm different, that I don't fit in. But in those moments when I was struggling, if I had seen messaging like this, Dave, you're strong. Dave, you're ready. Dave, you are not alone. And it is okay to ask for help. That would have had a different impact. Messaging, positive messaging. This will help encourage help-seeking behaviors rather than normalizing the, the problem, talking about the problem. So when we shift the message to, the positive, focusing on our strengths, our natural abilities. We can help make a difference and help encourage help-seeking behaviors in our SMVF community. Impact of messaging. We can change the narrative. 
So Jason, how might we change the narrative and yeah, engage so differently? You keep this up so well, Dave, this, this, this shift from um, coming from a healthy place, trying to acknowledge the, the, the concern, you know, the, the disproportionate rates of suicide and mental health and substance abuse and all that. But if that's our message and that's our narrative, that's, that's not awesome for a veteran to, to feel like they're going to reach out. Um, one of the things that on a local level, more of a grassroots kind of an intervention thing that we've experienced in my community in northern Minnesota, we've had for many, many years a, a local crisis response team. So there's a helpline, there's a, you know, a, a toll-free number that people can call in locally and access services to all sorts of things in our community. And one of the services that's available is a crisis team, a mental health crisis team that will respond via telephone or text or come in person and do the thing. Well, we were noticing a disproportionate number of veterans reaching out for services. And so in 2018, our local um, program developed a veterans crisis response team. It's comprised solely of veterans. You need to be a veteran to be on the team. Now, I want to make mention of something here. That's not to suggest that only veterans can help veterans because that's just not true. That's just not true. And at the same time, we were noticing in crisis how differently our veterans would respond if the person that was coming to talk to them could say, hey, I served where, you know, I, I was this, I did that. And I'm not saying I have the same experience as you, but there was just a little bit more of a join up happening. We were, we were noticing. One of the things, one of the many things that this crisis team does in our community is, is outreach and awareness, talking to service agencies and public health and schools and, and, and different sectors across our community. And when I go and have these talks, the narrative I'm trying to flip, I go in there and I say, let's talk about who we are as veterans. And the words I'm using are the words you used when we did the work cloud. We talk about how, you know, we are, we are service oriented. We, we, we sacrifice, we, we, we give of ourselves. We care about our community. We are patriots. And it's been so fulfilling to be a part of this team. Uh, we, this is a picture of us having been awarded a, a life-saving award from some suicide intervention stuff that we've done. But it's veterans helping veterans in honoring who they are through this positive lens of being, you know, a servant spirit of being giving. That's who we are. We're not, we're not broken um, and we can help one another. So your, your team not only responds and helps veterans, but you talked about just a little bit, the, the speaking at various agencies, you, you're working almost as like a, a cultural broker, broker building bridges exactly. as well. One of the other real significant differences between our conventional crisis team, which works with an individual in the crisis, in the emergency room, on the phone, at their home, when they were in crisis. But then after about 24 hours, that team hands everything off to whomever and whatever might be in place for them because their their role is crisis. The veterans crisis team, we will stick with a veteran for as long as they want to keep with working with us. I can think of, well, one gentleman in particular is a Vietnam veteran, no family, no real connections, and he struggled with a lot of stuff. He's not in crisis right now, but our team members will reach out to him, pop in and play cribbage with him for a half hour or an hour, have a cup of coffee. And just let him know that he still has family. He still has, he's still part and he's connected. And what that has done for him, and I got to tell you what it's done for us, those of us who serve in this capacity to give back that way, it's been amazing. Now I got to be honest, if you're thinking about, oh, how might we build this up in our local communities? You got to take care of your team members because we've had to work through some PTSD being triggered by some of our team members by coming around and working with folks, but it's been a, it's been a really cool model. It's been a neat thing to be part of. Yes. A different way to both engage the SMVF community, but then also help change the narrative in your conversation with other organizations within the community as well. I like it. I like it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Hey, that picture, it looks like you, the others, you like me no. in the middle. It's vaguely yeah. like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, Hey, What's number two on our list here, Sarah? So number two, Jason, you chose to join. So why do you complain? Yeah. Ooh, that's a tough one too, right? Why would you say that to somebody? Like you volunteered for this. You weren't drafted. 
Mm, mm. I enlisted, you know, I enlisted before the Gulf War One was even a thing, before anyone knew it could possibly pop up. And then as it did, I remember having close friends and family coming to me saying, oh, wow. I mean, I bet you kind of regret that you signed up now, huh? What? It's a variation of this. Like, boy, you, you made the choice. That's tough, isn't it? Ah. I was so dismissive of, of my reasons for, cho- for, for serving or my motivations or that I would only be willing to serve if I knew that I would never be called upon, right? No, don't say things like this. Don't say things like this. Yes, indeed. Well, sir, what are we doing here? Practical vision. What would it look like? Yeah. So now we are going to take our, our final moments and really spend our, our last moments together thinking about where you would see the work that you're doing within five years. We, we have all been called for this work because it's our heart, it's our passion, whether it's because we've served, because we've loved someone that's served. And we each have individual hopes and dreams for the work that we're doing and the communities that we serve, whether it's at a state level or in your local community. Or even if it's a current family member or loved one um, that we're looking at engaging right now. And so we want to take this opportunity to see what's around the corner. What do we see, you know, in five years from now, if you had all the money in the world, if you had all the grant funding, if you had all the personnel that you needed to put these tactical teams in place, what would engagement look like in your community? What messaging would you share? Would it be on social media? Would it be on television? Um, Just really big vision five years from now. Think about where your, your work is going to be. And so before we can open up our, our, our workspace and our workbook and start digging in. I want everyone to just take a few minutes to yourself and close your eyes and really imagine the work that you're doing. Imagine being nationally recognized at a conference and um, receiving an award. Just really For the work that you are doing and, you know, a reporter is interviewing you, what would you say? What would be that highlight? Um, What partnerships do you have? What is the community saying? What are those veterans and families saying to you, thanking you for this amazing new innovative program that you have changed their lives with? And just really think about that for a few moments, um, and then we will dig into our our workspace and give you an opportunity to write this down on paper and take this with you. Yes, indeed. Visualization. What is that practical vision? What are you going to tell folks? This is what we've done. This is what we've accomplished. This is what we have in place. Yes. As you work on that vision, I'm going to drop another link in the chat box. And it is to our visioning template. It's also linked in the participant workbook. And what it is, you know, we've talked about things to be mindful of when engaging, when supporting, when serving the SMVF. Community. We've talked about risk and protective factors, the challenges we face. We've also talked about changing the narrative, the, the positives, uncovering, supporting, and growing the positive. So with that Google Doc, I want to just give you time. We're going to give you 10 minutes to go into breakout rooms and simply start taking these ideas that are bubbling up, these new thoughts, these new inspirations, capture them, and start moving them towards action towards taking steps. And what that Google Doc looks like here is this. Please walk through, craft what you were just picturing in your mind. How are things going to be different? What is your current reality? What y'all got going on right now? 
as it relates to that vision, what's there to help you? Then start thinking about what are those steps that you can take? What are those key actions? What are you going to do in the next two to three weeks to keep this vision moving forward? Start reaching, start taking steps to make this vision become a reality. All right. So you likely won't get through all of this in the 10 minutes that we're putting your breakout rooms, but this is something that you'll be filling out just for yourself. It's another forced copy. So this is for you. This is a tool for you to use to start moving these ideas forward into action. We're going to do just 10 minutes of the breakout. You're going to work through it on your own. Feel free to talk with your, your roommates, bounce ideas off of each other, ask questions, or simply buckle down and get to typing and filling it out yourself. We'll see you back here in 10 minutes. All right. Welcome back, everybody. And yeah, just wanted to remind you that that is your Google Doc. You can go to File, Download, Save It as a Word Doc. Use that tool. Use that template. Wanted to give you a chance, like I said, to just really start to take these ideas, capture them, and start to move them towards action. Oftentimes in the hustle and bustle of work, we attend training, we got a great idea, and we step right back into our email inbox. It's hard to grab onto those nuggets of wisdom to keep them moving forward. We're not going to debrief that because that's all very personal about where you're at and what you're going to do. And, oh, we made it to number one. Oh my gosh, what is this one? Number one, Dave, you were just following orders, weren't you? Right? Yeah. This, just like the other one too, talking about kind of dismissing our service and our decision making. I'm an individual. I'm capable of making decisions. It belittles my intellect as well. So yes, don't say this to veterans. I talked about resources in the, the end of your workbook are links to these websites. The VA has a community provider toolkit. Great one. Psych Armor is where you can go take the, the deep dive military culture training. It is free training there available at psycharmor.org. Maketheconnection.net is one of my favorite websites because it has direct interviews, stories from veterans talking about their unique experiences, their challenges. And it also includes a section of resources for families and those that support and serve veterans. This last one is a newer one that I wasn't aware of, but VAs reach, reach out. They're starting to change the narrative to provide that comprehensive platform for veterans, offering resources and support tailored to their unique needs based on various aspects of their identity, such as gender, race, and so many more. It's really designed to address those diverse challenges that we all are experiencing and facing from all walks of life. But again, those resources are at the end of your workbook. All great, wonderful resources. Before we hit that last one thing, Sarah, hit us with a preview for next yes. week. So hopefully we will see you all back again next week. I am really excited to bring to you a topic that I am very, very passionate about, the Homefront Heroes. So strengthening our military families and youth. Um, as I shared earlier, as a proud Navy brat, uh, a sister to two um, combat veterans, I have you know personal experience as to what it was like as a military family member and navigating the challenges of substance misuse and suicide prevention. And so next week we're going to take a look at the risk and protective family factors through the lens of the family members, especially the children. And we are going to talk about some evidence-based strategies and programs that can really help increase that resilience within our military youth. And I am going to share about a national initiative called the Purple Star Award Program that has boomed so much within the last two years um, nationally recognized programs supported by DOD, Military Child Education Coalition, and many other uh, organizations, including 43 states and the state of Louisiana. And want to just walk you through how you can work within your state and community on 
building that resiliency for our military connected youth and families. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. If you aren't registered, the link to register is in the chat box. And also, if you know somebody else, like, hey, would love for you to join me. Share that. We've got room. There's always room for more because prevention is better together. Right. Well, really we, better we, together. We'll probably do some callbacks to some of the stuff we've yes. referenced today. Today's session is not a prerequisite to attend next week's session. So it's mm -hmm. certainly fine to yeah, have others jump into that. Absolutely. And while Jason brings us home, I'm also going to drop the link for the evaluation in the chat box. Anonymous feedback would greatly love and appreciate any insights, wisdom, thoughts related to today's session, because that's going to inform our upcoming two more sessions. Additionally, once you submit the evaluation, you'll be presented with another link. That link is so you can fill out your name and email to get your certificate for today's session. It will automatically be emailed to you after you fill out that second form. So once you do the evaluation, keep your eyes peeled for that second link to be able to get your certificate. So Jason, bring us on home. Yeah. So then what's something, what's the biggest thing? What's one thing that you're taking from today? We would love, you know, it helps us to know what, what landed. Um, and it can help you to kind of stop and check and reflect back on all the ground we covered and think back to what's, what's your biggest takeaway. So please drop that into the chat or if you're more comfortable, just on mute and, and shout it out. Tell us what's, what's the biggest thing you're taking from your time with us this morning. I'm going to bring up my chat here. And yeah, thanks for stopping sharing so we can see everyone's full, beautiful faces and energy. What's coming home with you? What, what did you, what did you take? I guess one of the things that we mentioned it a couple of times in our small group was as you were going through like the don't says mm -hmm. that how offended we were. Um, just like, I can't, how, how do people get, make their mouth say that? Like I, like that somebody would think it was okay. Um, so I don't know, like it surprised me, some of them, how angry it made me just to know that anybody would be asked that question. Um, so I'm sorry that you guys have been asked that question, those questions before. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. that that's powerful. Thank you. What else really landed with you guys? One of the things in, from our small group, um, uh, ours included a few people who were employed through the correctional institutes. And one of the things that was said to us was that there are more veterans incarcerated than walking um, out freely. And that is um, pretty powerful. Mm. Mm, that's heavy. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. What else came up? What were some themes or, or concepts that really landed? And some of you doing the evaluations because you're just diligent. That's who you are. I am. I can see what's going. I get what you're doing. I Charmaine, you got something for us? There Ooh. were, I mean, there were quite a few aha moments. And we talked about in our small group that, you know, just things that we never would have thought of thinking outside the box, uh, you know, so, I mean, that was kind of, I don't know if everybody else got that, but there were quite a few, we talked about aha moments like, oh, okay. Yeah. I never would have, never would have thought about that. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you all for, oh, Dr. Tolbert. Did I see? Okay. Yes. I was just going to say the very last, um, activity, interactive activity we did with looking at what would we, how would we use this information moving forward? Um, it gave us an opportunity to think about before we leave the session, what are we going to do with it? And then be able to discuss it with someone and to hear their side of it as well as what they will take away. Um, I think it was a learning opportunity, especially in our group. Thank you, doctor. That's, that's very nice. And hi, this is Quinetta. I have been uh, intermittently involved, but I could tell you that the messaging um, was something that was really, really useful because we're always trying to create flyers and get information out. You know, this is one of our priority population. And we just went through an exercise. Creating messages mm -hmm. and 
I saw the way you all did that, I was like, mm. one of them we nailed it, the other one we didn't nail it, not so much. Um, trying to stay away from the doom and gloom type of graphics. Um, so I think that was really helpful about the messaging. And then, I mean, just the whole topic of do's and don'ts. Um, for me, that was very informative. Things that I really haven't considered that could be offensive um, to service members and veterans. So, I mean, I think overall it was very informative. Um, like I said, although I was here intermittently, I still got something out of the discussions I was able to participate in. So thank you all um, for taking the time to share this with us. And hopefully over time, we'll get more and more uh, participation <laughs> um, in this session. Um, so that's what I have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your contributions to this whole thing. This, this, this wouldn't have been what it was without your inputs and your insights. So, really, Rochelle, did you have something too? I saw you come right. up meet real quick. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. Yes, I did, and I was about to type it, but oh. I love the fact that I had, uh, I learned rather um, new tech, new terminology. I'd never heard of moral injury before. I didn't know it was a thing, but I did hear it mentioned in the mm -hmm. community, not realizing it was moral in injury. So I do appreciate that. At least when I hear it, I'll associate the two things I've heard. So thank you for that. Wonderful conversation. Y'all are doing amazing work, doing amazing work. And I know Sarah and Jason are just as grateful as I am that y'all took time out of your day to, to have this important conversation with us. And, and it is a conversation that's going to continue on to next week. And then also the following week there as well. And would love to see you. I know we're two minutes past the hour. Grab your workbook, save your workbook, download that. There's more information in there that wasn't packed in these slides as well, because we couldn't get through it all today. So with that, y'all keep up the great work. Fill out that evaluation and we'll see you next week.